Hello, and welcome to the LaRouche Connection. I'm Donna Scanlon. Debunking myths is one thing the LaRouche Connection takes pride in doing, and this program will do just that by demonstrating the completely fraudulent character of recent ass assertions that after the Orange County derivatives-led collapse, after the Mexico crisis, and after the Barings Bank collapse, that the international financial system is somehow alive and well. Just how close the world came to financial and monetary disintegration following the collapse of the British investment bank bearings was intimated in a March speech by U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission Chairman Mary Shapiro. Speaking to the annual meeting of the National Futures Industry Conference in Florida, Shapiro said, it is important to understand the truly international character of the problems that Bering's demise created, despite Bering's fairly minimal direct contact with the U.S. markets. The delays encountered in transferring positions and funds had potentially significant systemic risk implications. Shapiro went on to tell the conclave of international speculators how she and her staff worked, quote, for five days, virtually 18 hours a day, to get the futures exchanges and regulators of other nations to adopt tested U.S. practices in order to avoid a system-wide freeze of liquidity. We talked, cajoled, and pressured foreign exchanges and regulators to transfer positions from various bearings accounts, Shapiro said. Extraordinary efforts were made to design and implement systems ad hoc to permit the transfer of positions at exchanges that had no rules for such transfers. But while Shapiro boasted how U.S. regulators and policymakers had successfully crisis managed the sudden obliteration of bearings, prominent voices in Europe and elsewhere were beginning to hint that the international financial and economic crises required emergency action. At the United Nations Social Development Summit in Copenhagen during March, the idea of a 0.05% tax on short-term foreign exchange transactions was proposed and widely discussed as a means of redressing the budgetary difficult difficulties of the UN. Though this by itself may not appear to be a response to the turmoil in the financial markets, the fact that International Monetary Fund Managing Director Michel Camdessou declared himself open to such a proposal suggests that a significant shift in thinking at the highest levels of international banking and finance is beginning to occur. None of this would have been possible had it not been for U.S. physical economist Lyndon LaRouche's spring of 1993 proposal for a 0.1% tax on all financial derivatives transactions. In fact, for the paranoid derivatives dealers, it may have sounded, by the second week of March, as though almost everyone were demanding a take of their casino's profits. French President François Mitterrand and socialist presidential candidate Lionel Jospin expressed support for controlling derivative speculation through a similar international tax during the UN Copenhagen conference. In a front-page article in the March 10 issue of the weekly Die Zeit entitled Wild Bet at Any Price, Former German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt charged that derivatives, quote, have spread more rapidly over the world in the last years than any epidemic. And he outlined three necessary steps. First, said Schmidt, national legislatures, including the German parliament, must hold special open public hearings on derivatives. Second, banking control authorities must intervene in every individual case in which it seems to them that the internal control system of a bank with respect to derivatives is inadequate. Third, said the former German chancellor, to all non-banks, the participation in abstract financial derivatives deals is to be legally forbidden. The Germans appear to be the most serious in addressing the issue at the moment. 
On March 20th, the Social Democrats presented a grand motion in the Parliament signed by Rudolf Scharping, the National Party chairman and opposition leader, declaring that in light of the billions of Deutschmarks in derivatives losses suffered by two leading industrial groups of that country last year, the assurances of German finance minister Theodor Weigel that derivatives pose no fundamental threat to the economy must be called into question. The motion included 20 questions concerning government plans for monitoring derivatives and for forcing banks, companies, and municipalities to report how much money at risk they have in derivatives activities. A parliamentary debate on the grand motion is expected to occur soon. Even the stoical German central bank, the Bundesbank, could not escape the issue. In an interview with the German weekly Wirtschaft Woche on March 19th, Edgar Meister, a Bundesbank director, was asked for his opinion about imposing a punishing tax against financial speculation. Now, while Meister hastened to reassure everyone that there was no threat of a systemic collapse, he did say that, quote, any proposal to restrict purely speculative transactions should be studied seriously. On March 14th, Canadian Foreign Minister André Ouellet revealed that officials assigned the task of preparing the agenda for the Group of Seven meeting in June in Halifax, Nova Scotia, had been informally discussing the idea of imposing a tax on currency transactions as a means of discouraging speculation. The information I have received is that there is genuine interest on the part of many to discuss this, Ouellé told the External Affairs Committee of Canada's Parliament. The very fact that it would be on the agenda and that it would be discussed in Halifax is an immense step forward, he said. The next day, no doubt reflecting the concerns by the in international banks that the issue is even being discussed, a spokesman for the Canadian Foreign Ministry insisted that the issue be discussed in the context of an upcoming review of the 50th anniversary of the Bretton Woods system, mandated at the Group of Seven meeting in 1994 in Naples, whether or not the financial markets are in turmoil. Then on March 16th, Hans-George Fabricius, vice president of the Central Bank of the German state of Hesse, told the Hesse Banking Association that current German regulations on high-risk instruments, such as derivatives, were insufficient. Fabricius attacked the dangerous tendency of many to dismiss the bearings collapse by asserting that it was only an isolated case that cannot happen here, or that the demise of bearings was not caused by derivatives per se. The real emergency lies in the near future, Fabricius declared, and warned that even worse derivatives failure is inevitable and will be much more devastating than that that hit bearings. Fabricius's warning was amply proven within days in Italy. On March 16th, the Ital Italian parliament approved a major austerity package aimed at reassuring financial markets about the stability and soundness of Italy's economy and currency. But on March 18th, in 30 minutes of panic, as one source at the Banca d'Italia called it, the lira collapsed 5% against all other currencies, reaching a historic low of 1,280 to the Deutschmark, while the Milan stock market plunged by 3.4%. The panic defies monetarist arguments for stabilizing measures since it occurred within days of the legislative enactment of exactly such stabilizing measures. Whence do the massive sale orders come? The Italian newspaper La Repubblica asked. It is primarily the result of derivatives, those strange financial products that have brought Bering Bank's bank to its knees. It was no surprise, therefore, that the instability of the world's financial markets was the major topic of discussion during the meeting of European Commission foreign ministers in France. Commission President Jacques Santerre, former Prime Minister of Luxembourg, called on the G7 to take action to restore stability to the world's currency markets by reviving the international cooperation typified by the Plaza and Louvre Accords of the mid-1980s. 
the London Financial Times fretted that Santerre, quote, told the Commission colleagues at their regular weekly meeting that he would clearly like to teach speculators a once and for all lesson. French Foreign Minister Alain Juppé, who presided over that meeting, declared that a reform of the world's currency system is indispensable. Otherwise, he warned, every country in the world will be exposed to foreign exchange turbulence with all its dangerous consequences for economy and society. But such instability is an effect, not a cause. The underlying problem that has yet to be addressed is that the world's physical economy has been decimated by the past three decades' policies of post-industrialism, financial deregulation, environmentalism, and population reduction. Until it is admitted that the past three decades' experiments in free markets allowing money to seek the highest return has been an utter failure, there is nothing in store for the world but more financial turmoil and the new dark ages of the worst economic collapse in history. Simply moving customers' accounts from one bankrupt derivatives player to another, the desperate gambit used by U.S. CFTC Chairman Shapiro to contain the collateral damage from the implosion of bearings merely postpones the inevitable day of reckoning. What is needed is a return to real economic activity building the water, transportation, education, and other systems human beings need. That means that governments need to stop worrying about balancing budgets and reassert sovereign control over money, seizing control of credit flows from the stupid financiers and bankers who, as the smoking crater that once was bearing the tests, are only killing themselves and everyone else anyway. At a recent conference of the Schiller Institute in Washington, D.C., Executive Intelligence Review's Ibero-American Affairs editor, Dennis Small, demonstrated that the debt crisis that was so much in the news in the past has also not gone away and threatens to explode at any moment. Dennis Small visited Ukraine at the invitation of members of Parliament who had been in Washington when he gave the presentation you are about to see. Within days after Small's visit and conference presentations in Kiev, a majority of the Ukrainian members of Parliament voted to refuse the shock therapy policies demanded by the International Monetary Fund. And now you, so, you shall see what Dennis Small had to say in Washington. In the old days, you used to hear that uh, depressions can't happen anymore, debt explosions can't happen, the system is under control. Those of you who are unfortunate enough to have studied economics uh, in American universities or m most universities abroad, uh, besides extending my condolences to you, um, You'll probably recall that famous textbook by Paul Samuelson, one of the Nobel Prize winners, uh, which was called Economics, um, in which he said that there was no possibility of any further depressions. We had built-in stabilizers, so it can't happen here. On December 20th, 1994, just a couple of months ago in Mexico, of course, the debt bubble blew up. And it's very hard at this point for people to run around saying it can't happen here when it did happen here. So that's not the mythology that's promoted these days. Now you hear different stories. For example, you hear the fairy tale that it was the Mexican anomaly, which was very bad and very serious, but it is this which caused a general systemic crisis. Yes, we do have a crisis, but it was caused by Mexico. And the second myth, which is quite closely related to the first one, is that since this was an, an anomaly, it will not be repeated. There will not be a repeat of Mexico so long as the necessary measures are taken. For example, those which Michel Camdesou, the managing director of the IMF, is proposing, which is that the IMF receive additional powers, additional funding, to proceed with the extremely successful policies which they've carried out so far in cases such as Mexico or Ukraine, as we've just heard, and so forth. Now, both of these myths are absolutely and completely false. Uh, however, you do see today, if you look around the world, that pretty much every single 
indebted country is scrambling to differentiate itself from Mexico. Everyone is saying, we're not Mexico, just us chickens here, we're not Mexico. Uh, Mexico, by the way, has become an adjective. I don't know if you're aware of this. In Argentina recently, one day when the stock market plummeted 6% and their currency was under tremendous pressure and so on and so forth, it was de described by traders down there as having a, quote, a Mexico day. <laughs> And people talk now about doing a Mexico. <laughs> so <laughs> you have the finance ministers of countries such as Argentina or the Philippines or Brazil scampering around the world trying to convince uh, bankers and other predators that they are absolutely not like Mexico. They're not similar in any way whatsoever. Uh, my favorite story is what uh, the comment coming from a Brazilian banker a couple of months back, actually, right after the Mexico events occurred, where he complained vociferously to the Wall Street Journal, how could anyone possibly consider that Portuguese-speaking Brazil could be like Mexico? He said, and this is a quote, we don't even speak Spanish here. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's, let's get to the reality of the situation. The myth that the systemic crisis was caused by Mexico, it's not true. In fact, the Mexico crisis was caused by a generalized systemic crisis, not the other way around. And secondly, it is not the case that it's over with Mexico. Quite the contrary, this is just the very tip of the iceberg, as, as John was explaining. There is more coming. For starters, Mexico again, by the middle of this year, if not sooner, will blow apart. Also high on the candidates' lists are Argentina, Hungary, and very possibly Russia itself. The reasons for this are twofold. First of all, that these crises are created by a combination of two circumstances. First, a cancerous growth of indebtedness and other obligations, such as derivatives. That on the one side. But that cancerous or speculative growth alone is not sufficient to lead to the kind of catastrophe which we're facing today, the meltdown, disintegration scenario. It is that combined with the destruction of the physical economic apparatus itself, the decay of the actual physical parameters of the economy of the sort Chris was describing earlier uh, this afternoon. It is the combination of these two processes that lead to necessary explosions of the debt bomb in places like Mexico and elsewhere. And if you look at it from this standpoint, you will immediately recognize the absolute insanity of every single proposal, other than those put forward by Mr. LaRouche, in circulation in the world today. Because every single one of these proposals, as will be discussed in these evenings, this evening's presentations, simultaneously worsen both aspects of the problem. They increase the speculative bubble, the cancer, while at the same time destroying the productive apparatus. And these are then proposed as solutions. This is exactly IMF policy. Every single policy proposal that the IMF has ever made in any country, and I challenge anyone anywhere in the world to come up with any evidence to the contrary, just one case and I'll back down. Every single case where the IMF has implemented its policy, it has simultaneously increased the cancerous bubble and at the same time destroyed the productive economy. Is it a surprise that their policies lead to genocide? Of course not. They're designed to do that. Now let's look, for starters, at why the debt bomb blew up in Mexico. And for that, I want the first slide, if we can get to that. And these are the detailed statistics that will tell you why there was a crisis in Mexico. None of it has anything to do with Mexico. These figures have absolutely nothing to do with Mexican statistics proper. What you have, the big red bar on the left, is the growth of derivatives on an annualized rate between 1986 and 1994. 59% per annum annual growth rate over this period. Drugs, as John explained to us a moment ago, is the only thing that came anywhere close. Grew at 25% per year on average during this period. The third bar, which you can't see, because it grew 0%, so it's absolutely flat, is steel production per capita. That's world steel production. 
a boom industry, as you can see over this period. And the fourth column, which you probably also can't see unless you've got very good eyesight, is grain production, which dropped by 1.3% per capita over this period. That's on an annualized basis. Those are the annualized rates. So on the one hand, the derivatives were expanding tremendously. On the other hand, real production falling apart. Second uh, slide. What happened with this derivatives bubble? Where did it go? Well, one of the places that it went is into the indebtedness of the so-called develop developing sector countries. And these are figures which uh, I've graphed based on official World Bank statistics. This comes from the 1995 recently issued World Bank uh, World Debt Tables. And the blue bar, which begins at $658 billion, is the total debt of all developing sector nations in 1980, $658 billion. The red bar, which grows progressively over that period, is the cumulative interest paid on that foreign debt, cumulative over that time period, so that between 1980 and 1994, a 14-year period, $1,071,000,000,000 dollars were paid on a debt which began at $658 billion. So after paying almost twice what they owed originally, the countries at the end of the process owed $1,945,000,000 billion three times what they owed at the beginning. That's a nifty trick. And of course, the arithmetic is obvious to anyone. 658 minus 1,071 equals 1,945. And that's what we call banker's arithmetic. That's an example of a derivatives bubble in operation. Now that the Mexican debt crisis was a direct result of this process is very clearly seen by looking at the evidence. First of all, and here I need to go to the overhead, first overhead transparency. We're going to be switching back and forth here a little bit, but it's all on the same screen. The first thing that happened is that in Mexico, a policy of free trade was deliberately imposed, forcibly imposed on the country, beginning in about 1986-87. 86, 87, not 91 with NAFTA. The idea that NAFTA was a free trade agreement is nonsense, which is communicated only by the name North American Free Trade Agreement. It had almost nothing to do with free trade because all of the so-called free trade achievements of lowering tariff barriers and opening up the economy and so forth had all been accomplished beforehand. In the 86 to 87 period, it began. And what you can see is that on the left side of the graph, the lower line says imports. Beginning in about 86 or 87, as the economy was totally opened up, those imports zoomed up to nearly $59 billion in 1992, while exports rose far more slowly, leading to a trade deficit, an annual trade deficit, which was very, very sizable by 92, 93, 94. A very big tr uh, trade deficit, which, along with debt service payments that Mexico also had to make, left Mexico with a gigantic hole that had to be paid, a gigantic deficit which had to be paid off, as a result of a deliberate policy imposed on them. Once this had been accomplished, the second step was taken by the banking community, which was to flood Mexico with speculative capital, flood Mexico with parts of the derivatives bubble send in derivative speculation into Mexico to help cover that growing deficit. And the next overhead transparency shows you, gives you a, a, a partial picture of what that flow of so-called foreign investment, almost all of it speculative, actually looked like. You can see that up until about 1988-89, this was not a very large amount of money. Then in 90, 91, 92, and 93, the yearly amounts began to really skyrocket. Uh, in fact, the, the amount for 93, that was a preliminary figure. The total amount is actually much higher than that 21 billion. It was closer to 30 billion dollars in hot money coming into Mexico. Hot money which was used to cover the trade deficit, used to cover the debt service payments, but hot money which went into Mexico like a horde of locusts. This is money that went into the Mexican stock market, money that went into the Teso Bono 
or in other government treasury bill markets, reaped an incredible speculative profit, and then was prepared to exit at the drop of a hat. And that hat dropped on December 20th of last year. So it was this flow of immense amounts of speculative money which actually was the, setting the stage for the debt crisis which blew up in Mexico at the end of last year. Let's quantify it. Between 89 and 94, five-year period, the actual foreign debt of Mexico, the official foreign debt, rose by $42 billion. So they took in $42 billion in new money. In addition to that, approximately $90 billion of this type of money, speculative, hot derivatives money flows, also came into Mexico. A total of over $130 billion flooded into Mexico, prepared to leave at a moment's notice. And, of course, what this showed up as, if you look at the next slide, um, can I have the slide now? There we go. This is Mexico's real foreign debt. The, the blue curve on the bottom is the official foreign debt, which, as of 1994, added up to a mere $141 billion. However, the red part on top that I've added on, adding up to a real foreign debt, are other foreign obligations not counted in the foreign debt, such as teso bonos, which are owed to foreigners, such as cumulative foreign investment in the Mexican stock market, and so on and so forth, money that could be pulled out at a moment's notice. At the end of 1994, that totaled $213 billion. And the projection we have here for 1995 is that these will both increase, and Mexico will end up at the end of this year, unless there is a policy change, with total foreign obligations of $265 billion. Now, this is what's happened to the speculative or the cancerous side of, the, of this process. Let's take a look at what's happened to the Mexican physical economy. If the Mexican physical economy has been growing at comparable or greater rates, no problem. You can even pay off a user or a, a mafia man so long as your actual productive capabilities are growing as fast as or faster than what he's demanding of you. But let's look at what IMF policies have done to Mexico's physical economy over the last decade or two. The next slide, please. The red bar on the right is the growth of debt between 1981 and 1993, over a 12-year period. The official foreign debt of Mexico grew by 234%. The first red bar on the left is negative. That's steel production. It dropped by 27% in 12 years. Grain production. Minus 22 percent. Cement, minus 2 percent. Meat, plus 2 percent. I should say that these figures on all of the physical economic parameters which I'm presenting here, all of them are calculated in physical economic units. This has nothing to do with money. This has nothing to do with pricing. These are physical units. Tons per capita. Uh, kilowatt hours per household. Uh, and so forth and so on. These are physical units of production. And this is what happened to the Mexican physical economy. Uh, the next transparency, please. I'm sorry, the next slide. This is indices of the production of market baskets of producer and consumer goods. We took 17 producer goods and about 15 consumer goods in the case of Mexico. A lot fewer than how many? 250? How many? 225 that, that Chris has uh, for the United States economy. But these are indicative types of goods. They are representative of the fundamental aspects of the market basket of producers' goods, such as steel, cement, and so forth, and consumer goods, food, clothing, and so forth. And you can see if you make a total index of these two functions, and you take 1981, which was the turning point in Mexico, after which IMF policies were applied. Up until 81, there were no IMF policies in Mexico. IMF policies begin to be applied in 82. Therefore, 81 is the turning point. And if you index that to 100, you can see that Mexico had a respectable rate of growth, nothing tremendous, but respectable, both in producers' goods, which rose from an index of 75 to 100, 
which is a 33% growth rate, and consumer goods, which went up from 69 to 100. After 81, thanks to the IMF and thanks to the derivatives uh, looting operation, the consumer's good index dropped from 100 to 80, a 20% drop in per capita terms, and the producer's good index dropped from 100 to 73, a 27% drop in per household terms. So while the debt was growing stratospherically, the actual productive economy of Mexico was falling apart. Small wonder that this should be heading for a blowout at some point, and the blowout, in fact, did occur. Now, as most of you are probably aware, LaRouche and Executive Intelligence Review forecast that exactly such a blowout would occur. While everywhere around us, all of the experts with all of their degrees with all of their qualifications for the Nobel Prize, all of the unfortunate readers of the Samuelson textbook and the followers of the more recent Nobel Prize winners who promote slavery and other such things, all of them said it was going wonderfully well. And by way of comic interlude, I have a few quotes that I would like to read you. If I can have the next slide, please. This is Nicholas Brady, Treasury Secretary of George Bush. This is during the Brady Plan. February 4th, 1990, he said, A new dawn is rising. Mexico stands as a beacon of hope for other debtor nations. The burden of foreign debt has been removed from the shoulders of the Mexican people, which is something I'm sure they'll be very glad to find out about. <laughs> what did we say? Next slide. EIR, April 93, a year and eight months before the thing blew out. We said the following. A financial blowout is imminent. Other Ibero-American economies that have followed similar regimens, such as Argentina and Brazil, are also rapidly approaching a blowout phase. In short, the charade about the Mexican success story is about to end. Will the nations of Eastern Europe, of Ibero-America, and of the rest of the Third World wake up in time? Next slide. More Brand X. Malcolm Forbes, billionaire, August 1992, quote, the Mexican government is performing a miracle rivaling those of Germany and Japan after World War II and of Korea and the other so-called Asian tigers in recent years. The U.S. Congress should take a crash course in economics from Mexican President Salinas. <laughs> and everything indicates that they did. Do you know that President Salinas is now on the advisory board of Dow Jones? It's true. He's, yeah, he's hired. He's hired. That's, he's up here in the United States. That's his job. Since he did such a great job with Mexico, that he's now going to proceed to the entirety of Wall Street. <laughs> Hold on to your pocketbook. Next uh, slide, please. This is LaRouche, August 1993. Mexico is suffering the spillover of a global pattern typified by the growth of the derivatives bubble. When it will pop, we can't say. But looking over the period, the next 9 to 12 months, we must expect major financial implosions. Coming out of the activities of pirates, buccaneers, thieves, such as George Soros. That's what LaRouche was saying in 93. Now, where are we today? Uh, I'd like the next overhead transparency. The Mexican bubble blew out in December, as you know. And one of the things that happened is, in order to try to forestall the worst developments coming off this, a rescue package was put together consisting of about $48 billion. Actually, up until last week, it consisted of $51 billion, but the $3 billion coming from the commercial banks vanished last week, they decided they were not going to pony up any money. This was coming from Citicorp, Citicorp and J.P. Morgan were heading up the, the team on this. They, they said no dice. So $48 billion is the money to be made available Mexico to Mexico over the course of this year to face or to deal with the amount of uh, instruments coming due over the course of 1995. 
Now, that $48 billion package consists of $20 billion from the United States, $18 billion from the IMF, and $10 billion promised by the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, meaning other governments in different parts of the world. So a total of $48 billion. But there's a problem here, which is a problem which was, became apparent in Mexico over the recent weeks. And that is that Mexico has obligations which are absolutely definitely coming due over the course of 95, which are at least $15 billion greater than what they have available. $63 billion. I can give you the breakdown on that. If you're interested, you can read it in our publications. But believe me, that's a conservative estimate of what they absolutely have to come up with this year, $63 billion. They don't have it. So as easily as we can calculate this, people who have piles of money sunk in Mexico and invested through the derivatives operations and so on are, can also read the writing on the wall. They know that this Mexican quote-unquote solution is going to blow apart. The actual fact of the matter is that there could be as much as $123 billion coming due over the course of 95, depending on how things evolve. That additional uh, gray portion on the top of the bar diagram includes such things as foreign investment in the cumulative foreign investment in the Mexican stock market, which could be pulled out at a certain point. Plus, it includes certain uh, categories of Mexican private sector foreign indebtedness, which is currently not due in 95, but will come due, will be made to come due as soon as they are late in a single payment. In other words, these are so-called trigger clauses in their debt agreements abroad, so that if they are late at all on their payment, the entire bill comes due. Sort of like your phone bill, you know, if you don't make one payment, then all of a sudden you owe nine back months, that kind of thing. So that's why you could have that type of situation developing in, in Mexico over this period. Now, what, what, what the Mexican government, most of these geniuses trained at Harvard and places like that, what they've done to deal with this, as we can see in the, in the next transparency, is complete, utter clinical insanity. I had to redo this graph because the last time I used it at our conference, what was it, a month ago, something like that, the interest rates at that time were a bit over 40 percent. <laughs> but since then, the Mexican government has raised the interest rates on 28-day Treasury bills to 83 percent. Now, the idea supposedly is to raise interest rates high enough to attract capital, to pull in money, hot money, to bail them out. Now, of course, what's happened with the 83 percent interest rates is that nothing of the sort has happened. What has happened instead is that it has induced utter panic in Mexico, complete terrorized panic in the Mexican population and in, and in financial circles. And, well, what it's done, for instance, is that the actual interest rate on overnight money in the Mexican banking system is about 110%. Credit card interest, interest rates now range between 150 and 170%. And there is, there is a total meltdown going on in Mexico right now. This is, in one sense, far worse, certainly psychologically, far worse than the first ratchet between December 20th and January 30th. Because then people were hoping, well, maybe the packet that's pulled together will somehow work. What's become clear from January 30th until March 20th, around now, the end of March, is that the packet that's put together is not going to work and that what the government is doing is actually making the problem worse. So what you can, you get a sense of when you talk to people in Mexico, I was just down there a few weeks ago, in business layers, political layers, and so on, is real profound panic and rage. They're furious over what's going on, and they're looking to LaRouche, as people are in many parts of the world, to try to figure out what to do. What's going on in Mexico? Since January of this year, there are one million new unemployed in Mexico. One million new unemployed out of a labor force of maybe 25 million. And with an existing real unemployment rate of close to 50%. On top of that, there's one million new unemployed. In the state of Jalisco, the capital of which is Guadalajara, which is the second largest city of Mexico. This is one of the major important states of Mexico. The federal social security system has embargoed 9,000 companies, put them into receivership, to sell off their assets 
to force them to pay the Social Security system because the companies can't pay. They've been embargoed by the Social Security system. They're now bankrupt, 9,000 companies. Out of Mexico's 32 states, 20 states claim that they are at the edge of debt moratorium because they cannot make their debt service payments. Not that they want to do it. They have no choice. They can't pay. The Mexican population, about 85 million, 40 million are classified as being officially living under the poverty line. 40 of 85, not as bad as Ukraine, but bad. And of those 40 million, 17 million live in extreme poverty. And this was before the crisis hit. Real wages from 1982 until right before the crisis had dropped by approximately 50%. Since the crisis, inflation is estimated this year to be 42%. It'll be much more, but that's the official estimation, 42%. The wage increase, which has been granted to workers, is 10% against 42% inflation. Do the arithmetic. 42 minus, this is not banker's arithmetic. This is the real, 42 minus 10 is 32. That's a one-third reduction of a real wage level which has already dropped by half over the last 10 to 12 years. You tell me what's going to happen. Now that's Mexico and it's going to blow up again. But let's, let's look outwards from Mexico since the Mexican case study is useful to give us an idea of how this derivatives cancer destroys a specific situation. Now let's look outwards and see where else this thing is already striking because the idea is that this debt bomb explosion is spreading. And I'd like to return to uh, the slides, and we'll, we'll skip over the next overhead. I'm not doing the next one. If you thought Mexico was bad, look at Argentina. The two dark squiggly lines in the middle are indices of producer and consumer goods from 1970 to 1994 in Argentina. As you can see, they're completely flat. This is actually worse than what we saw in Mexico, because Mexico's, if you'll recall, rose for a decade from 70 to 80 and then dropped. So they've seen 10 years of collapse in Mexico, maybe 12 years. Argentina has seen 25 years of stagnation and decay of its physical economy. Not so its debt. The debt on an index basis has grown from a low of 15 up to 296 in 1994. So there you see the cancer set off against the physical economy. Next slide, let's look at the picture for the totality of Ibero-America. The lower blue curve is Mexico's real foreign debt from 1980 to 1994-95, which grows from 57 billion to 265 billion. You can see that that 265 billion today is a larger amount than the entire foreign debt of all of Ibero-America back in 1980, which was 257 billion. But that $257 billion has approximately tripled to $732 billion, three quarters of a trillion dollars that Ibero-America owes in actual foreign obligations at this point. The next transparency, sorry, next slide. This is a snapshot of the, of the Ibero-American physical economy. Keep in mind the debt growth and look at the physical economy. Consumer goods, flat, rose from 91 to 100, and then dropped from 100 to 87 over the last 10 years on an index basis. Producers' goods rose fairly respectably from 60 to 100, over 70 to 80, from 1970 to 1980, but then stagnated completely uh, over the last decade or so, while the indebtedness, the speculative bubble, uh, rose very substantially. The next slide also look, gives us a picture of one specific feature of the Ibero-American economy. This is grain production per capita. This is all grains. This is corn, wheat, uh, uh, rice, and so on, the basic food items which population needs to survive. You can see that in the case of Ibero-America, there was a very small per capita increase over the first decade we're looking at. And then after 81, under IMF policies, per capita grain production dropped from 292 to 232 kilograms uh, per capita. And you can compare that to the figure for the United States in 1980, which was 1,181. 
<coughs> four to five times larger, just to give you an order of magnitude. Now the next slide, please. And here we have the situation of Ibero-America's debt. Once again, a little banker's arithmetic, just to walk you through this in case, for some reason, it doesn't quite add up for you. Mech, uh, sorry, Ibero-America's foreign debt in 1980 was $257 billion. Over the next 14 years, in cumulative interest payments, they paid $417 billion. They owed $257, they paid $417, and at the end of the period, their debt had doubled, and then some, to $547 billion. Or, as we show above, 257 minus 417 equals 547. <laughs> I think this is probably what they, uh, the economists all mean when they call derivatives a zero-sum game. <laughs> means it doesn't add up. Uh, next slide. That's Ibero-America. Now let's look at the world. This is the total debt of the world, of the developing sector countries, from 1980 to 1994 by region of the world. And since I can't read... All right, I can't read what those things say on the side. Maybe the, 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 the bottom one, the green one, is Ibero-America. The next area is, oh, I mean, you need new glasses here. OK. All right, East Asia and the Pacific is the blue one. The red one is Europe and Central Asia. The yellow one is Middle East and North Africa. The magenta one above that is sub-Saharan Africa. No, wrong. South. Sa South Asia, and the gray one is sub-Saharan Africa. Keep your eye on that red one in the middle, Europe and Central Asia. That's very interesting. Now, you may not be able to tell this just by looking at it, but the shocking thing about this, if you look at this, is that the Ibero-American debt problem, which we've discussed so far, is actually the portion of the world debt which is growing most slowly. That's the least of the problems. And in the next slide, you can see growth rates that indicate how this is, in fact, the case. The world average is the red horizontal line. Total indebtedness is growing at about 8% per year over this period. Ibero-America grew at 5.5%, Middle East and North Africa by 6.7%, Sub-Saharan Africa by 6.8%. Then you have three areas which grew far more rapidly, close to 11%. South Asia by 10.6. Europe and Central Asia, again, remember this, Europe and Central Asia, 10.7% annual growth rate of its indebtedness. East Asia and the Pacific, the fastest growing of all, 11.1%. Now that is the actual picture of the rates of growth of world debt. So Ibero-America is really not our problem at all when we're talking about foreign indebtedness. Let's look at this question of Europe and Central Asia. What are the countries that we're talking about here? Well, the World Bank lists the countries. And I'll read off a few of them to you with their respective foreign debts. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Bulgaria, $12.3 billion. Czech Republic, 8.7. Hungary, $24.8 billion. Ukraine, according to uh, a quick consultation I did with Professor Moranivsky, approximately $7 billion. Poland, $45.3 billion. Portugal, 37. And Russia, $83.1 billion. Now, what's going on here? The finance minister of Hungary, uh, Bekesi, recently resigned, and his departing quote was the following, quote, Hungary could be the next Mexico, close quote. So you have the growth of a speculative derivatives-led bubble in countries like Hungary, very similar to what's happened in Mexico. But in one sense, perhaps the most strategically significant is the situation around Russia. And I want to conclude just by giving people a quick sense of what this crisis looks like, uh, very briefly, in terms of the Russian situation. 
shock therapy policies, IMF policies, were implemented in Russia beginning in January 92. Now, one of the immediate effects of this was to force a massive devaluation of the ruble. The ruble in January of 92 was worth 70 to the dollar. About a year and a half later, August of 94, the ruble traded not at 70 to the dollar, but at 2,000 to the dollar. In other words, the ruble was worth about 3.5% of what it had been worth 36 months earlier before IMF policies were applied. And then in the next six months, from August 94 until today, January, February 95, the value of the ruble dropped again from 2,000 to 4,200 rubles to the dollar. That's another 50% devaluation. Devaluations are very useful instruments for the bankers for the pr purpose of looting an economy dry. That's what's happened in the case of Russia. What's happened in Russia in three years in this regard is what took 13 years to happen in Mexico. One interesting distinction, a decade faster, three or four times faster. Now, the next transparency gives an idea of some of the actual production figures. In, uh, all right, skip one and then go to the next one. In Russia. These data, by the way, are taken from a presentation given at our recent conference uh, by Uwe Frisica based on information developed out of our Wiesbaden office um, by Mikhail Liebig and Konstantin George. All right, this shows the Russian physical economic collapse. These, again, are physical economic units taking 1990 as an index of 100. That's the gray bar. The black bar next to it is the same item, but in 1994. Oil production in Russia dropped by 40% over four years. Copper production dropped by 38%. Nickel by 63%. And I should underscore that these production figures actually under-represent the gravity of the crisis because the bulk of the production, far more than before, is now going to export. So what's left behind for consumption is even much less, and in some cases, negative. They're actually negative numbers because they're going through stockpiles. This gives you an idea of what the picture looks like on raw materials. The next uh, transparency gives an idea of what the industrial picture looks like in Russia. Total industry, total industrial output dropped by half over four years, from 100 to 50. Machinery dropped by two-thirds. Current production levels are one-third of what they were four years ago. Light industry, 20%. And then this last character, uh, category, MIC employment. The MIC stands for Military Industrial Complex. This, this is the technological core of the Russian economy. This is the high technology area with the greatest potential productivity, with the greatest contribution uh, to the economy in terms of its productive output. This area, the employment in this area, has dropped by approximately a third over this, over this four-year period. The consequences of this in terms of the labor force, and I, I think people should keep in mind the figures we, the, the startling, shocking figures we heard earlier in Ukraine, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, because we have the same type of situation precisely in, in Russia. Uh, in terms of the life expectancy of males in Russia, in 1990, it was 63.8 years. Four years later, it had dropped to 58.9. That's an incredible drop for a national average statistic, something like life expectancy, to drop that much over that period of time. Infant mortality has almost doubled from 14 per thousand to 30 per thousand today in Russia. And as a result of these effects, the total population of Russia has actually declined in each of the last four years. There is actual total decline of the population of Russia. I think it's fairly obvious on the basis of the information that's been presented to you over the course of today that to do something like this is absolutely to play with fire. We are facing a thermonuclear chain reaction of the financial system that is exactly what we are on course for, unless it is put through the kind of reorganization pr uh, process which LaRouche has, has outlined. 
I think that the point that should be made in terms of the strategic situation is that we're facing not only the prospect of a financial thermonuclear nuclear chain reaction, we are facing the prospect of an actual thermonuclear chain reaction when you start playing games like this with countries such as Russia and Ukraine and others who, as I've noted before, a country like Russia may have a foreign debt which is comparable to Mexico. However, the number of nuclear warheads in their arsenal are completely different. Thank you very much. Funds had potentially significant systemic risk implications. Shapiro went on to tell the conclave of international speculators how she and her staff worked, quote, for five days, virtually 18 hours a day, to get the futures exchanges and regulators of other nations to adopt tested U.S. practices in order to avoid a system-wide freeze of liquidity. We talked, cajoled, and pressured foreign exchanges and regulators to transfer positions from various bearings accounts, Shapiro said. Extraordinary efforts were made to design and implement systems ad hoc to permit the transfer of positions at exchanges that had no rules for such transfers. But while Shapiro boasted how U.S. regulators and policymakers had successfully crisis managed the sudden obliteration of bearings, prominent voices in Europe and elsewhere were beginning to hint that the international financial and economic crises required emergency action. At the United Nations Social Development Summit in Copenhagen during March, the idea of a 0.05% tax on short-term foreign exchange transactions Hello, and welcome to the LaRouche Connection. I'm Donna Scanlon. Debunking myths is one thing the LaRouche Connection takes pride in doing, and this program will do just that by demonstrating the completely fraudulent character of recent assertions that after the Orange County derivatives-led collapse, after the Mexico crisis, and after the Barings Bank collapse, that the international financial system is somehow alive and well. Just how close the world came to financial and monetary disintegration following the collapse of the British investment bank Barings was intimated in a March speech by U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission Chairman Mary Shapiro. Speaking to the annual meeting of the National Futures Industry Conference in Florida, Shapiro said, it is important to understand the truly international character of the problems that Bering's demise created, despite Bering's fairly minimal direct contact with the U.S. markets. The delays encountered in transferring positions and factions was proposed and widely discussed as a means of redressing the budgetary difficult difficulties of the UN. Though this by itself may not appear to be a response to the turmoil in the financial markets, the fact that International Monetary Fund Managing Director Michel Camdessou declared himself open to such a proposal suggests that a significant shift in thinking at the highest levels of international banking and finance is beginning to occur. None of this would have been possible had it not been for U.S. physical economist Lyndon LaRouche's spring of 1993 proposal for a 0.1% tax on all financial derivative transactions. In fact, for the paranoid derivatives dealers, it may have sounded, by the second week of March, as though almost everyone were demanding a take of their casino's profits. French President François Mitterrand and socialist presidential candidate Lionel Jospin expressed support for controlling derivative speculation through a similar international tax during the UN Copenhagen conference. In a front page article in the March 10 issue of the weekly Die Zeit entitled Wild Bet at Any Price, former German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt charged that derivatives, quote, have spread more rapidly over the world in the last years than any epidemic. And he outlined three necessary steps. First, said Schmidt, 
national legislatures, including the German parliament, must hold special open public hearings on derivatives. Second, banking control authorities must intervene in every individual case in which it seems to them that the internal control system of a bank with respect to derivatives is inadequate. Third, said the former German chancellor, to all non-banks, the participation in abstract financial derivatives deals is to be legally forbidden. The Germans appear to be the most serious in addressing the issue at the moment. On March 20th, the Social Democrats presented a grand motion in the parliament signed by Rudolf Scharping, the National Party chairman and opposition leader, declaring that in light of the billions of Deutschmarks in derivatives losses suffered by two leading industrial groups of that country last year, the assurances of German finance minister Theodor Weigel that derivatives pose no fundamental threat to the economy must be called into question. The motion included 20 questions concerning government plans for monitoring derivatives and for forcing banks, companies, and municipalities to report how much money at risk they have in derivatives activities. A parliamentary debate on the grand motion is expected to occur soon. Even the stoical German central bank, the Bundesbank, could not escape the issue. In an interview with the German weekly Wirtschaft Woche on March 19th, Edgar Meister, a Bundesbank director, was asked for his opinion about imposing a punishing tax against financial speculation. Now, while Meister hastened to reassure everyone that there was no threat of a systemic collapse, he did say that, quote, any proposal to restrict purely speculative transactions should be studied seriously. On March 14th, Canadian Foreign Minister André Ouellet revealed that officials assigned the task of preparing the agenda for the Group of Seven meeting in June in Halifax, Nova Scotia, had been informally discussing the idea of imposing a tax on currency transactions.